Hello and welcome to this CUBE conversation. I'm John Furrier, host of the CUBE here in Palo Alto, California. We got two great guests all the way from Ohio and here in the Bay Area with Sequence Security. This is our focus on cloud growth companies. Uh, Shreyans Mehta, co-founder and CTO of Sequence Security and Jason Kent, hacker in residence at Sequence Security. We're going to find out what that actually means in a second, but this is a really uh, important company in the sense of APIs as they are starting to be the connective tissue between systems and, and data. Um, you're starting to see more vulnerabilities, more risk, but also more upside. So risk reward is high, and anyone who's doing anything in the cloud obviously deals with APIs. So Trey and Jason, thanks for this CUBE conversation. Happy to be here. Guys, let's, let's talk about uh, API security and and but first, before we get there, Shreyans, what does uh, Sequence Security do? What do you guys specifically um, build and what do you sell? Sequence is in the business of protecting your web and um, APIs from various kinds of attacks. Uh, we protect from business logic attacks, API, uh, do your API inventory, uh, we uh, also attack, uh, detect and defend against things like account takeovers, fake account creation, scraping, pretty much anything and everything an application or an API is exposed to uh, from, from the attackers. Jason, what do you what do, what do you do there as hacker and residents? I also want to get your perspective on API security from the point of view of, you know, um, an attack standpoint from a vector, how, how are people doing it? So first explain what you do and uh, love the title, hacker and residents, but also what does that actually mean from a security standpoint? Yeah, so uh, we can't be in the business that we're in without having an adversarial approach to where our customers are deployed and how we look at them. So uh, a lot of times I spend my time trying to beat on a client's back doors and, and try to hit their APIs with as many kinds of attacks that I can. It helps us understand how an attacker is going to approach a specific client as well as helps us tune uh, for um, our machine learning models uh, to make sure that we can defend against those kinds of things. Um, as a hacker in residence, my mostly my uh, position is you know client facing, but I do spend an awful lot of time doing research and looking for the next uh, API threat that's out there. Yeah, you got to stay ahead of the bad guys, but let's bring up some kind of cutting edge relevant uh, topics. One is uh, all over the news cycle, you heard Peloton, a really highly visible company. It represents that new breed of digital companies that have a new approach and it's obviously doing very, very well. And the new consumers like this product and you're seeing a lot more Peloton like companies out there that are leveraging technology. So they're fully integrated. They had an API issue recently. Um, what yeah, does this mean? Is that, is that something we're going to see more of? These kind of leaks and these kind of vulnerabilities? What do you guys think about yeah. this Peloton thing? You know, from an attacker's perspective, it's a really boring attack, um, but it led to a huge amount of data leaking out. Uh, same with, you know, the news has been, been ripe with this lately, right? John Deere got hit. Um, we've seen a, a yet another credit bureau got hit, right? Um, and these attacks are coming off uh, as fairly simple attacks that are dumping huge amounts of data, just proving that the API attack surface is really a great place to get a rich amount of data, but you have to have a good understanding of um, how the application works. So you got to spend a little bit of time on it, but once you've taken a look at how the data flows, you end up with you know, a pretty rich data set. As an attacker, I go after them just by simply utilizing their products, utilizing the programs and understanding how they work. Uh, and then I drag out all the pieces that I think are going to be interesting and start you know, plucking away at it. If I see a, like a profile, for instance, that I can edit, I wonder, can I edit someone else's profile? And this is how the Peloton attack worked. I'm logged in, I'm allowed to see my things. What other things can I see? And it turns out they could see everything. So we also saw a, a hack with Clubhouse, which is the hot app now. I think it just opened up to Android users, but they were simply calling a backend Agora, which is you know obviously in China. But once you understood the, how the tokens work, once you understood what they were doing, you could essentially go in and figure things out. This seems to be like pretty like trivial stuff, but it gets exposed. No one kind of thinks it through. How does someone protect themselves against these things? Because that's the real issue. Like, does this make it? less secure, our API is going to be more secure in the future. What can customers do about it? What do you guys to think about this? Yeah, so the, the reality is, I mean, there's just uh, too many APIs out there. I mean, the, the, if you see the transition that is happening, 
in the digital transformation where it used to be like a, a one app or two apps before, and now there are like hundreds and thousands of applications driven by the DevOps world, agile development. And, and what matters is, I mean, I mean the, the starting point really is you cannot protect what you cannot see, right? What used to be uh, an app hosted in your data center is now being hosted in the cloud environments, in the virtual environments, in serverless environments, in Kubernetes, you name it, they are out there. So the, the key is really to understand uh, your attack surface. That's your starting point. Uh, so um, your, your tooling, your applications need to, um, need to be able to um, provide that visibility that, that, uh, that is needed to protect these applications. And you can't rely just on your developers to, to do this for you. So you need uh, a, a right tool that can secure these applications. Jason, what's the steps that an attacker takes to uncover vulnerabilities? What, what, what goes through the mind of the attacker? Um, I mean, in the old days, you, you know, you used to just do port scans and try to penetrate, you get through the you know, perimeter. Now with this no perimeter mindset, the surface area Shreya was talking about is huge. What are, what's yeah. going on in the mind of the attacker here on the APIs and vulnerabilities? So the, the very first thing that we do is we sign up for an account. We use the thing, right? We look at all the different endpoints. Um, I've got scripts running in my attack tools that do things like show me comments uh, in case a developer left some comments in there to, to tell me where things are. Um, I basically am just going to poke around using it like a regular user. But in that, I'm going to look for places that make sense to try to do an attack. So a login screen is a real easy thing. Everybody understands that. You put in a username, you put in a password, you hit go. What I'm going to do is put in a bad username and a bad password. I'm going to put in a good username and a bad password. And I'm going to see what changes. What are the different things that your application is telling me? And so when we look at an application for flaws and ways to get to the data on the back end. All we're doing is seeing what data do you present me on, you know, standard use. And then I'm going to look at, well, how can I change these parameters or what are the things that I can change in my requests to get a different response? So in the early phases of an attack, attackers are very difficult to see, right? They just look like a regular user just doing regular things. It's when we decide, all right, I've found something uh, that it starts to get actually interesting and we start to try to pull data out. What are some of the common vulnerabilities and risks that you guys see in the APIs when you look, when you poke at them that people are, are doing? Is it they're not really doing their homework, doing good security design, or is it just more of tech risk? What's the most common vulnerabilities and risks? Well, so for me, uh, I've noticed a lot of um, the OWASP API top 10, the first couple of things you see them on almost all applications. So broken object level authorization is the first one, it's a mouthful. Um, but basically all it is, is I log on to the platform, I'm authorized to be there, but I can see someone else's stuff. And that's exactly what happened in Peloton. Um, that and what we call insecure direct object reference where I don't have to be logged in, I can just make the request without any authentication and get information back. So those are pretty common areas um, that you know people need to focus on, but there's a few others that are outside the OWASP top 10 that, that really make a lot more sense. As, as a defender, Shrain's probably has a little better answer than me. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I'm, like, like we said, um, creating that inventory is, is key, but where are they being hosted is another, another aspect of things. So, so when, when Jason spoke about um, like hackers are actually probing, trying to figure out what are the different um, entry points, uh, it could be your production environment, it could be your QA environment, staging environment, and you're not even aware of. But once you've actually figured out those entry points, the next step of attack was like at Peloton and, and other places is really exfiltering, exfiltrating that, uh, that information, right? Uh, is, it, is it your PII information, PHI information? Um, and, and you don't want to exfiltrate as a hacker just one person's information. You are, you're automating uh, that business logic that is behind it ability to protect and defend 
against those kinds of attacks, giving that visibility, even though you might not have instrumented that application for, for that kind of visibility is, is key. Once you're bubbling up those behaviors, then you can go ahead and, and, and protect uh, from these kinds of attacks. And it could be about just simply enumerating through IDs uh, uh, that that Peloton might have or uh, uh, Experian might have and, and just enumerate uh, through that and exfiltrate the information behind it. Uh, so yeah. the, the, the tools need to be able to protect from those kinds of attacks out there. Yeah, I think I was actually on Clubhouse when um that went down, that whole enumerating through the IDs, room IDs, and then the people just querying, once they got an ID, they essentially just sucked all the content out because they were just calling the back end. It was just like the most dumbest thing I've ever seen. But they didn't think about it. I mean, you know, you know, they were just rushing really fast. So, so the question I have for you, is, and on a defense basis, people are going first party um, with APIs, API first strategies. Um, because there's just some benefits there as we were talking about. What do I need to do to protect myself so I don't have that clubhouse problem or the Peloton problem? Is there a, is there a playbook or uh, is there software tools that I could use? How do I build my APIs from day one and my principles around it to be have good hygiene or good design? What's the, what's the, uh, what's the Yeah, practice? so uh, API security is sort of a little, uh, less known uh, given that it's constantly uh, evolving and changing and, and the adoption of APIs uh, have gone up significantly. So we, what you need to start with effectively is the runtime security aspect of things. When a, an API is live, how do I actually protect it? And it, it ranges from uh, simple syntactic protection, things around that people can, can go ahead and, and break these APIs by providing sort of uh, um, going after endpoints that you don't think uh, exist anymore or going after certain functions by giving large uh, values that they're not um, sort of coded to accept and so on and so forth. Uh, once you've done that runtime protection from a syntactic aspect, you also need to protect from a business logic aspect. I mean, APIs will, will expose uh, to in, uh, information to interact with the customers and partners what what business logic are they actually exposing and how can it be abused? Understanding that is another big aspect. And then you can go ahead and protect from a runtime, um, uh, from a runtime security perspective. Once you've done that and understood that well, then you can start, start shifting left. Things that invest in your uh, sort of uh, DAS tools or, or uh, static analysis tools, which can catch these things early so that they don't bubble up all the way. But none of them are actually silver bullets, right? So that yeah. you have a good uh, runtime security tool, so I don't need to invest in DAST or a SAST, or I have, a, I have invested in my shift left aspect of things and uh, and nothing will flow through. So you, you need to start shifting left, uh, but cover all your bases properly. Yeah, and you can't shift left, there's nothing to shift from. I mean, if you don't have that baseline foundation, what does that even mean to shift left and get that built into the CI/CD pipeline? So that's a great point. Um, how do the, how does someone and some companies and teams set that foundation with the runtime? Do you think it's a critical problem right now, or most people are do a good job, or they just get they get lazy or just lose track of it? Or you know, what, what's what's the common um, use case? Do you see behavior behaviorally inside these enterprises? Yeah, so what, what we're seeing is adoption of new technologies and environments, um, and they're not um, well suited for the traditional way of uh, doing runtime security. Like if, if you have an app uh, running in your Kubernetes environment, if you have an app running in, in, in a serverless environment, how do you actually protect it with a traditional appliance-based approach? So I, I think being able to get that visibility into these environments understanding the, the user behavior, how these applications are interacted with, being able to differentiate from that uh, normal human behavior, or even sometimes legitimate automation uh, from, from the malicious intents or, or the, the, the probing and the uh, business logic attacks uh, is key to uh, understanding and defending these applications. Before we wrap up, I want to just get your expert opinion since you guys are both here around, you know, the the, the next level of, of innovation. Obviously you got cloud, public cloud showed us APIs are great. 
now you're starting to see cloud operations, they call day two operations or whatever you want to call it, AI ops, there's all kinds of buzzwords are for it, but hybrid cloud and multi-cloud, edge, 5G, these are all basically pointing to distributed computing systems, basically distributed cloud. So that means more APIs are going to be out there. Um, so in a way, the surface area of APIs is increasing. What's your, what's your view on this as a market? I mean, early days, uh, developing fast, and what's, what's, the, what's the landscape look like? What do you guys see from an you know, attack and defense standpoint? Well, just from an attacker's perspective, you know, I see a lot more traffic going, what we call east-west traffic, where it's traveling inside the application. It's APIs feeding APIs more data. Um, but what is really happening is we're trying to figure out how to hook third parties into our APIs more and more. The John Deere attack was just simply their development API platform that they open up for other organizations to integrate with them. Um, you know, it's it's very beneficial for John Deere to be able to say, I planted this seed at an inch and a half of depth and later uh, I harvested 280 um, bushels of corn off that acre. So I know that's perfect. I can feed that back to my seed guy. Well, that kind of data flow that's going around from API to API means that there's far more attack surface and we're going to see it more and more. I, I don't think that we're going to have less APIs communicating in the near future. I think this is the foundation that we're building for what it's going to look like for almost every business uh, in the near term. I mean, this is the plumbing of, of integration. I mean, as people work with each other, data transfer, data knowledge, format, you mentioned syntax, I mean, all these basic things in computer science are coming to APIs, which was supposed to be just a dumb pipe or just, you know, REST API it was the glory days. Now it's not, they're, they're basically, it's basically connections. Yeah, you're absolutely right, right John. I mean, like what Jason mentioned earlier, um, uh, in terms of the way uh, the APIs are going to grow and the bad guys are going to go after it. I mean, you need to think like a bad guy. What are they going to go after? Um, these, these assets that are going to be in the cloud, in your hybrid environment, in, in your on-prem environment. And, and it's it's a flip of a switch uh, where, where an internal API can be externally exposed or, uh, or just a new API getting rolled out. So all those things you need to be able to protect um, and, and get that visibility first and then, be, uh, then protect uh, these environments. That's awesome. You guys represent the new kind of company that's going to take advantage of the cloud scale. And as people shift to the new structural change and people are refactoring security, this is an area that's going to be explosive in development, obviously the upside is huge. Um, quickly before to end, you guys take a minute to give a plug for the company. Um, this is pretty cool. I love, love what you guys do. I think it's very relevant and cool at the same time. So Sequence Security, what are you guys doing? Funding, hiring, what's the plug? Tell, tell folks about it. Yeah, Strange. so, so uh, we, we we started about six years ago, but uh, the, we like, starting in the, the bot defense space, but focusing on apps and APIs. And uh, from then we, we've grown and we've grown significantly in terms of our customer base, the verticals that we're going after in financial, retail, social media, you name it, we are there because pretty much all these, these uh, verticals depends on app APIs to interact with their customers. Um, uh, we've we've raised our Series B last year. We, we've grown our customer base uh, uh, in just in the last year when there was a lockdown. We, people were all these retailers were transforming from brick and mortar to online. Uh, social media also also grew, and we grew with them. So. Jason, your yeah, thoughts? I think that uh, Sequence's ability to scale out to any size environment, I mean, we've got a customer that does a billion and a half transactions a month um, that are APIs from a thousand other clients of theirs. Um, being able to protect environments that are confusing and cloudy like that um, is really, it makes what we do shine. We use a lot of machine learning models and AI in order to surface real problems. Uh, and we have a lot of great humans behind all of that making sure that the bad guy may be there right now, but they're going away and we're going to keep them away. Yeah, it's super, super awesome. I think it's, you know, a combination of more connections, distributed computing at large scale with a data problem. 
uh, that's that's playing out that you guys are solving. Great stuff. And hey, you know, when the Cube Studio API gets built, we're going to need to call you guys up to 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 help us secure the Cube data. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. Hey, thanks for coming on the Cube. Great uh, great insight, and thanks for sharing about Sequence. Appreciate you coming on. Appreciate the time. Okay, it's a Thank Cube you. conversation here in Palo Alto with remote guests. I'm John Furrier, your host. Thanks for watching.